Okay, so um, a short introduction from me. I'll go through some stuff and then we'll open to questions at the end. Um, so I'm, as you said, Vicky Higgins, CDIO of City Fibre, and that's our country's... Um, f sorry, I've got new reading glasses, so they may come on and off. I've got two pair of glasses up here, so <laughs> very focals next time. I'm going to go with that. So, um, yes, so I work for City Fibre. It's our country's third largest wholesale fibre provider behind um, BT Openreach and Virgin Media. Um, I generally work in the world of critical national infrastructure and construction. So whilst I work at a telco uh, today, um, providing the IT that underpins all the network um, for the wholesale fibre network, um, it's, you know, previously I've worked 22 years at National Grid in various business and IT roles, working in the gas and electricity transmission and distribution um, arena, looking after some of their non-regulated businesses as well from an IT perspective. <coughs> And then I've spent uh, three years at National Highways on the executive team, looking after all the IT, but also all the roadside technology that you see as you drive up and down the motorways. Um, I looked after their data, cyber security as well. So I hope you, that gives you some context in terms of what I'm going to talk about today. So what am I going to talk about? So I've been asked to speak on operational efficiency, and no doubt that is a topic that is very close to our minds in the current economic climate. It is for me and my CEO and my CFO right now. Um, and it's a live conversation, and I'm sure it will probably go on for the next 18 months to two years. And whilst we try and deliver on it at all times anyway, there's times when we have to dial it up and down. So when the CFO and the CEO said to me, hey, can you reduce your OPEX, Vicky? I asked, rather than asking IT to cut its costs, why don't we have a look at what IT can do for the rest of the organisation? Which, more often than not, has come as a surprise to this CFO at the time. And um, approaching the challenge that way has generally held me in good stead, where my team remain relatively untouched and even sometimes has increased to enable the rest of the organisation in their growth and efficiency plans towards the company EBITDA targets. In the words of my CEO, you can't cut your way to growth, and IT has definitely been seen as an enabler to that. So before we start, um, it's about forming an alliance with the CFO and fully understand the baseline. Let's see if this works now. There we go. That'll do. Um, so, you know, we get all the comments about IT. It's expensive. That's the first thing I got from our investors when I joined my current company. And, and one of the interview questions was, what are you going to do to cut the IT costs, Vicky? Um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric about that. So we need data. Where are we spending internally with the supply chain? Shadow IT, because a lot of the time there's a lot of that out there. Um, and, and the key thing for me is about getting it benchmarked. Um, get an idea of the current performance. My go-to place is Gartner. Other organisations are available. And my peer networks, these events actually are really useful to me in terms of finding out what everybody else is doing and what everybody else is spending. I look at the cost of IT per employee, capex, opex split, spend against revenue and forecast revenue, um, percentage spent on security, etc., etc. You get the idea. But what I can't, I can't tell you enough is data is king. It's unarguable and it takes the emotion out of the conversation. So don't fall into the rhetoric trap. Generally, what I try and do is keep my mouth shut when everybody tells me that it's expensive and I'll go away and find the data. At this point, I can't emphasise enough how important it is to have your CFO and your finance business partner at your side through this journey. You're really going to need them. Um, this is a quote um, from a book called um, CIO Going on CEO. And um, I love this, you know, it, it is for me, in all of the organisations I've been in, a key partnership. Don't fight the finance organisation, work with the finance organisation. So, of course, achieving IT operational efficiency is not a one-time event. It requires ongoing monitoring and analysis to ensure that we're continuously impro improving. This means once you have baselined um, your, your costs, you need to set the metrics. As they say here, what gets, gets measured gets done. 
Um, and it helps you with your narrative. Every time you go into the executive and you want to talk about what you need to invest in, every time you need to talk about where you need to cut costs and work with the business, it's part of the narrative. For me, it's a two-pronged attack, playing your part within IT as a good corporate citizen and developing opportunities for the wider business. And on the IT side of the house, it always comes with good housekeeping, where you can spend capex to reduce opex, the very ba basics being optimization. For example, where I walked into, for um, AWS environments, for, uh, you know, uncontrolled, um, four incident management systems, three project management systems, that kind of thing. So consolidation and decommissioning, even in the smallest areas of opportunity, for example, duplicate dev tooling, um, reduces the footprint of the tech landscape and it requires good architecture. And I love this slide. I keep going back to this slide. I saw it on LinkedIn once and I keep reusing it because it's true. If you're going to invest in anybody in your organisation, invest in the architecture. Because you would not go and build a house without the architectural plans. You why would you do it? Why would you wing it? This is such an important role. And this is the one, when it comes to resource committee, is the one I fight for. So from a quick practical perspective to assist with this, decommissioning and tidying up, you can set the expectation that in, in, in the investment papers that people bring in, they have to include the investment for the sunsetting of the old technology. And it must be part of the qualifying criteria and demonstrate that through the benefits cases in a reduction in overall OPEX. So I worked with the finance team to make sure, firstly, that we had investment papers, and secondly, to make sure that the total cost of ownership was included in those investment papers, and what are you gonna decommission as a result of commission in this system? Um, and it can be one system, it can be three, it can be remove, removal of FTE if it's being hand cranked, that kind of thing, but always set that expectation that you're not gonna work, move forward on that project unless it brings some kind of saving. It helps with your, your housekeeping as well. So, where business cases um, demonstrate increasing OPEX, they deserve a review and um, on the kickoff of the programme, ensure that they, there are points within that programme where there are kill switches. And um, those programmes, we've all been involved in those monolithic, solve it all programmes of work um, and you need to make sure that you continually review those to make sure that there is value delivered early, but you can stop that programme at any time. And we've all been in those meetings where we're looking at each other and nobody wants to make the call because they know it's not going right, but it's somebody's project and you're going to hurt some feelings. But if you're building those reviews up front before you set off on it, it's an expected thing around um, delivering that value early. Also, Agile delivery, you know, for me, that helps you deliver that value early. So wherever you can, building in sprints of agile delivery within those programs of work um, helps you deliver value early. Um, also, those big monolithic programs cost a lot of OPEX to run afterwards um, and sometimes hidden OPEX. As we all know, I'm looking at your faces. There's lots of smiles. You all know you've all been involved in them. Um, my biggest fight on that is making sure that the person sponsoring that program I works, the person that wants it really understands what the total cost of operation is. Um, and that happens a lot with regards to shadow IT, where somebody has gone and met a vendor at an event, they've sat them down, before you know it they've signed them up, um, and then there's a load of OPEX coming your way. So. Identifying and addressing the money going out the door is the first thing I did when I joined my current organisation. We identified the top 10 suppliers and we asked, is there a strategic vendor management wrap around them? Or are they writing their own checks? Um, have, they, have we let them land and expand? And so what we did was we refreshed and renegotiated the contracts and then line by line, we looked at the tail end of the spend. So the smaller, um, supply chain, which added up to a tasty little amount. We consolidated where possible 
and um, where there was limited vendor management capability, we employed an IT vendor management firm with an incentive to consolidate and bring that down. The other piece that I'm doing at the moment is using Gartner's, you know, I pay for Gartner, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, so I might as well use them. And one of the things that I do do is use their contract management service, where they go out and they go and find out what other people are paying as well, because it's really good when you, you come into a renewal um, and you need to negotiate that cost down, find out if you're being ripped off, use those services where you can. IT is always the cobbler's child. Um, we put things off for ourselves. Um, my dad used to be a builder and um, we always had a hole in the wall at home whilst everybody's houses looked beautiful that he'd worked on. Don't be the cobbler's child or the builder's daughter. Um, don't put it off. Um, you know, make sure that you don't kick it down the road and um, keep your security up to scratch and remain resilient. So it's time for... These are really great times of hardship actually, to turn them into opportunities to tidy up your estate. So now we turn our attention to the operational efficiency benefits for the broader business. And this is the bit where the CFO gets starts to get interested. Instead of giving everybody an arbitrary 20, 30% cut, actually, what can you do for the whole business? So getting your own house in order can be done in parallel with this, uh, whilst delivering opportunities with the business. Um, a cost challenge allows us to focus on what really matters, and it makes you actually quite inventive. So we remove all the non-value added hobbies and vanity projects that people have out there. And I've done this through ruthless and continuous prioritization with the executive team. In alignment um, with the company's strategic goals, through the lens of total cost of the investment and operation versus the benefits. So everything we've done, we've gone in and we've shown them a whole list we, we had something like a thousand feature development um, for a quarter and we ranked them against all of the business benefits. Um, we ranked that in business benefit in the next six months. Um, do you want to get to EBITDA earlier or 12 months? We then started looking at um, all the different criteria for the business objectives and having executive conversations about it. Um, it's not been easy. It's a muscle that you do need to build if it's not there. And plain English is really important. Um, don't bring your techie teams in to start talking tech to the executive. Um, a lot of my team said, well, they can just look in JIRA, can't they? Yeah. They can just look in JIRA. Like, no exec member in my organisation is going to go trawling through um, JIRA. So there's a real kind of piece of work around getting plain English language um, you know, that translation from the IT team into the executive. Our prioritisation for us has focused on revenue and growth, EBITDA, OPEX, extending our cash run runway. Um, we've given those so-called regulatory and compliance products uh, projects a good tyre kick in as well, because they were seen as a free pass. Um, you know, we would rather spend our development points on revenue generating or OPEX saving solutions and dealing with the regulatory requirements manually, if possible. So there's a lot of things we've been able to either negotiate away if they're contractual, or actually put some manual intervention in and focus our um, development on where we're going to grow. By doing this, we've put in a decision-making process. It is hands in the hands of the business, and it's all their hands on the knife. Um, this has served well when we've had to go back and do reprioritization exercises. Um, because actually, when you put the benefit up in front of people, where people have been really passionate about their projects, um, they, it's unarguable when you start to see the benefit. Here's a watch out though. So whilst you're satisfying the executive team and you may have colleagues or customers that are not getting their irritating and time consuming issues dealt with, um, you know, whilst they're trying to make themselves efficient, um, it, it doesn't make it to the top of the list because it's not big books, but it is irritating. So where possible with these smaller delighters, um, we've needed to deal with these through the dev team saving back an epic or two. 
And what they then do is go in, do a Gemba walk with those teams, and they will sit with those teams and develop those solutions where we can. So, for example, the contact centre, where they're on the front line and they're getting it in the neck every day. What can you do to automate, streamline, make that better for them? That's the most impactful changes for, the pe for your employees. So we leave them feeling happy too, but we withhold those epics or um, chapters, uh, especially for that. So in a rapidly growing business like mine, where we need the ability to scale, we grow the and, and grow the asset footprint, our asset being the wholesale network out there, um, and the customer base without increasing the headcount. So whilst we keep putting more connections onto the network, what we don't want to do is increase the, the people in there that are, are managing this. Um, it continues to be critical as, and it is the biggest OPEX driver. So deploying automation to customer orders and install journeys and RPA and AI and ML, those are the tools that we use to try and keep the OPEX down in the organisation. <coughs> We prioritise instant access of data and forecasting and AI where, um, where we can. So, for example, checking photographs of where we've built the fibre exchanges um, and, and running AI across those, sorry, ML across those to make sure that, you know, what's the quality of the workmanship in there. It stops building a big load of team, looking at all those as-built drawings coming back, all the assurance activities uh, in the build area and keeping that up um, that optimized that's a real focus for us there so it's all right doing all that tech but all of it needs good old governance so we the finance and the IT partnership have implemented appropriate governance and controls to assure that the board uh, to assure the board that we're spending responsibly but beware of overly onerous governance because it paralyzes the business um, we've all been there. It's about balance. In, as introducing um, focus and uh, control does have an immediate effect in slowing down the spending, um, changing the frequency of the government uh, governance to be more often will ensure that things don't get locked up. So instead of having a big monthly overly onerous governance one, stick a weekly one in if you need to. Preventing spend increases frustration and also reduces opportunity and productivity. So it's, for me, it's about the right size and going back and reviewing that governance. And finally, business change plays a huge part in this and also, ironically, is the one area that gets removed in times of austerity. There's no benefit to implementing technology if it's not adopted. The benefit we all proclaimed is diminished, so I beg you, please do not cut this team. So to summarise, it's not an exhaustive list, but make friends with the CFO and the finance business partners. Don't fight them. It will serve you well through the process. Make the effort. Offer up the opportunity to make bigger savings and growth for the business rather than just accepting and rolling over and taking the 30% cut. And show them, go back, and show them how you can do it. Benchmark and data, data rich, rhetoric poor. What gets measured gets done. Don't get sucked into the rhetoric conversations. Kit, you know, sometimes it's better to stay quiet, go away, get your information, go back. Use this time as an opportunity to sort your own house out. Optimise, rationalise and decommission. It will pay for itself. And prioritise together and do it often have all your hands on the knife that cuts the cake. I generally go, it doesn't matter to me what we develop. That's up to you. I'll do whatever you need me to do, apart from the IT bit, obviously. Um, but save some of those smaller delighters for your colleagues in tough times too. And good, gov good governance and business change, it's the oil that makes it all work. So on that note, on my journey, I am happy to have a discussion, take any questions, um, see what my pain was, learn from my mistakes.